Hallelujah. Stay with us just a second. Remain standing, would you? My, let me look at you. You know, God doesn't live in a palace. He lives in his people. Amen. And beautiful for situation is the city of our God. Tell that person near to you that Brother John thinks they look now. Use a little Texas. Real nice. Give him a little nice. Brother John looks real nice. Think you look nice. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I continue to come to this church. Very nice meetings. have not always been the largest meetings I go to, but I want to say that probably no greater integrity anywhere than in your pastors. Give them a hand. I see behind the curtain of most churches, and uh, it's this church is in good order, good order. Uh, I wasn't going to start with this verse. This verse is a disturbing verse, but I want to use it to get started with. I don't know whether you've ever noticed it before or not, but uh, and I didn't uh, mark it there. You can pull it up if you would. Isaiah forty-two nineteen. Isaiah forty-two nineteen. We're looking at the, and we're going to look at the King James. May as well use the Bible the Apostle Paul used. Uh, and this is, and listen to what this thing says. It says, who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blinder as he that is perfect and blind as the Lord's servants? <laughs> blind, blind, blind. I thought you, you would think we all saw pretty good, wouldn't you? You'd think, wow, we're informed. We know what's going on. I'm going to speak to you this morning on a subject I call hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. You know, there are many things in the Bible that are called a seed. Many things in the Bible are called a seed. But when you come down to naming them, some are metaphorical. They're not really a botanical seed that goes into the ground. Of course, we know the word is a seed fourth chapter of the book of Mark, the sower sows the word. The Lord Jesus is a seed. We've heard the seed of the woman. The kingdom of God is a seed. It says a grain of mustard seed, the Bible says. The offspring of Abraham are as a seed. It's, uh, it's really interesting that this scripture is probably easier understood by people that live on farms than it is that people live in the city. Because it just absolutely, based on the seed time and harvest principle, runs through every aspect of it. And then financial increase runs, is, uh, runs through seed time and harvest. The Bible, and if there's time, I'm going to read at the last here, probably in, first, in 2 Corinthians, the, first, uh, the ninth chapter, you find there that the Apostle Paul calls... Money given into the kingdom of God, a seed. And if it's planted, it grows. And if a harvest comes back, it doesn't come back one for one, but it comes back 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. But what is missing, I think, in our understanding of how to make this Christianity really optimize is how much seed time and harvest plays into almost everything you read in the Bible. But the Bible says our traditions make the Word of God of no effect. And so we tra don't traditionally hear about the seed, and it's really come to the point to where very little is said in church anymore about money because of some of the abuses that have taken place. But that doesn't mean that the story isn't there about money. That doesn't mean that you don't need to have finances. It doesn't mean that you have expenses coming ahead of you, that God wants you to live in abundance, I don't think we, I think we're to the point now we know that a, a rich God wouldn't want his children to be poor. That would probably be a form of child abuse. God wants you to be blessed. But I'm going to give about, oh, maybe four or five instances from Scripture that totally depend on seed time and harvest. But until I point it out to you, you won't see it. But maybe with this, you'll begin to look everywhere and say, what is the seed time principle here? What is the seed time principle here? Because the whole 
everything operates on seed time and harvest. Even your salvation, before you could be saved, a seed had to be planted. God planted a son because he wanted sons. And now he has many sons and daughters because as he gave one, the harvest comes back 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, and even billions now have come forth from that seed that was planted, Christ Jesus. But let's begin, say, in uh, uh, 1 Kings, uh, third chapter, third through the fifth verse. And I'm reading from the Living Bible. Sometimes the, the uh, overheads are not available from the Living Bible, but hopefully it is. It's when Solomon is visited by God after his offering. It says in that third verse, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all his father David's instructions, except that he continued to sacrifice in the hills and offered incense there. Uh, the most famous of the hilltop altars was at Gibeon. And now the king went there to sacrifice 1,000 burnt offerings. And the Lord appeared unto him in a dream that night and told him to ask for anything he wanted and it would be given to him. Now we have Solomon at a very unique time. He's building the temple. So he's in a tight financial position and he comes and he sacrifices to the Lord. And when the Lord answers him, he answers him in a most unusual way. Now, if you've been filled with the spirit and if you know uh, uh, the Lord in the dimension of having conversation with him, you know that from time to time he'll come and he'll speak to you and he'll give you something to do. Now, there's something unique here though. When Solomon is approached by the Lord after this offering, the Lord comes and says to him uh, in the same night, not a week, not a month later, but that same night, the Lord told him to ask for anything he wanted and it would be done for him. The Lord has come to me many times and showed me things to do. But to Solomon, he comes and says, ask me anything you want and I'll give it to you. How many of you know that's a pretty big blank check when God says, ask for anything you want and I'll give it to you. But now it seems like it's a point of favor with Solomon. But notice this, there was only one sacrifice required under the law, one. But Solomon brought a thousand. He bought a thousand burnt sacrifices, even to the point that there had to be an expansion of the place where the sacrifices were brought to contain the offering that Solomon brought. And now it comes to a point that what really is the principle of seed time and harvest here? Have we noticed it or not? But the Bible tells us that the size of an offering, now please understand, the size of an offering in relation to the person giving it. Because the size of the offering I might give this morning might seem like much to you or it might seem like little to you. God doesn't set values on things in relation to a guitar is worth so much, uh, a steel post is worth so much because God has everything. God depends on you to set the value. If it's insignificant to you, the offering will be insignificant to God. And if it's significant to you, it'll be significant to God. And at this point, thousand times more than required came. Well, does that make any difference if an offering is larger, if an offering is significant? Does that make any difference to God? Well, here's what the Bible says about the seed time and harvest principle. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, and this I say, he which sows sparingly will reap also sparingly, but he that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Many people say, I've heard the prayer prayed in uh, more, more in the time before in my earlier days in denomination, they would pray, God bless the giver and the non-giver alike. Well, it's, it's a, it's a, it sounds like a wonderful person that would say that, but it has nothing to do with the way that God operates because God does not bless the non-giver the same as the giver. Because God says, even he says, if you give little, you receive little. If you give much, you receive much. But now when I say much, it's not how much I would think is much. It has to be how much you would think is much. You follow that? Yeah. Be because uh, I've had people come to me and say, well, today I'm giving the widow's might, Pastor. I'm going to have to give the widow's might, widow's might. I think, glory to God, you're giving everything you have? 
But remember the widow, she had gave all she had, even all her living. So it was big time because the Lord said, this woman has outgiven everybody. Not because it was a cash amount more, but because in relation to what she had, it was more. Are you picking that up? All right, now, so we see there that as you pray, as you bring forth offerings, you have to realize that in relation to your own finances, if it's little, there'll be a small harvest. If there's much, there'll be a large harvest. Now, please know, this will not fly in the, in the school of uh, uh, political correctness of our day. But in the Bible, it says, if you sow much, you'll reap much. If you sow little, you'll reap little. It's like a farmer. If he plants just a small patch, he has a small crop. If he plants a lot, he reaps a lot because God has taken and set this fantastic program of seed time and harvest into almost everything that happens. It's all around us. Every place you look, you'll find it. Well, let's move a little bit further. Uh, you know, protocol with the Jews was a powerful thing. Jewish protocol was a very powerful thing. Acts uh, chapter 10 and verse 28 says, and Peter said unto them, you know that, in, that, that, is an, that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into one of the other's nation. Now, what is it saying? Why the Jew wasn't even supposed to enter the house of a Gentile. And Jesus, he was a uh, keeper of the law. He walked in all the precepts, but there comes a point where protocol is broken. There's going to be a request for him to come to a Gentile house, and he's going to go to that Gentile house, but it's not determined that he'll go until the elders of the Jews explain something about the man that is asking him to come. Now watch, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to preach politically correct, but I am trying to preach what the Word of God says. And you know, this is a, God said, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. So be real careful because when something out of this book doesn't fit with your way of making sense, you have to understand it. God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your ways. If you're going to get along with me, you're going to have to move over into my way of thinking, not me over, move over into your way of thinking. Most people, you know, God created man in, their, in his own image. And from that day on, man went on trying to recreate him in their, in their image. Think about that. But anyway, so here we see that this is not kosher, a Jew going into the house of a Gentile. But now we come to Luke 7, 2 through 7, King James. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus... He sent unto him the elders of the Jews. Now watch, he's, he's being very strategic. He understands that walking up to Jesus, Jesus will walk away from him. He's not going to have a conversation with that Gentile. But now he goes to the elders of the Jews and beseeches him uh, uh, that he would come and hear his servant. And when they, the fourth verse, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him and watch, instantly saying that he was worthy of whom he should do this for he loved our nation and hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. Are you picking that up? Yeah. Seed time and harvest principle again. This is not some little casual coin that was cast to one side. This man had done something substantial. And here's the reason that financial finances play such a big part into your relationship with God. Because really your money is your life. Your money is your life. When you have gone to work for someone and worked at a certain job, say for instance, I was a bricklayer. I started out as a bricklayer. If I was on a job and I laid brick all that day, I was there all that day laying brick. Now, at the end of that time, I had laid down my life for eight hours. I did what they wanted me to do for eight hours. Now, they gave me my money. But now my money all of a sudden comes into a, I'm in a whole new dimension when you look at me and my finances. Because in my physical form, I'm one dimensional. But in my financial form, I'm omnipresent. I can be anywhere in the planet that I want to be. 
For instance, this morning in Nicaragua, 250 children ate breakfast with me this morning. Now you say, did you run to Nicaragua? Yes, I did. But I didn't go in this clumsy physical form of mine. I went in this supernatural spiritual form of mine. I went with my finances and fed those children over there. Are you understand what I just said to you? There's something. And by the way, listen, you don't think your money is not, your money is you in so much more dynamic form than you're in right now. Your money can run in and out of the past. Did you know that? You watch, right? If you have a mortgage, did you know every day it's marching towards you to take your house away? And your money can push it back 30 days. Jump right, push it right back into the... Are you understanding that? How powerful your, uh, your finances are to just step in there and put that thing back in order. It's coming again to get you again. Next year, next month, you can put it right back in order again. You in your financial form are much more dynamic than you are in your natural form. Now, you might be more interesting, of course, that interesting person you are in your physical form, but in your financial form, you're omnipresent. You can do things that it's impossible for your human form to do. Are you catching that? So now, when you give an offering, you haven't just given some slips of paper. If you worked eight hours for that amount of money, you gave eight hours of your life was put in that offering plate. Yeah. Do you understand that? Eight hours of your life in that offering plate. I'm going to skip to something right now. And let me show you what happens to you. Hebrews, up there in the booth, if you can, run to Hebrews with me. And let's get to Hebrews four, uh, 11 and 4. Listen, if you ever put a penny in God's house, it starts talking and it never stops talking till the end of time. Listen what happens here when you read the fourth verse. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he, had, he, that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift. And by it, by that offering, he being dead yet speaketh. 4,000 years ago, Abel's offering is still talking and every cent you ever put into the gospel is still talking. When you came in, that door, if you're a part of it, I've got to watch it, I'll get away from my subject. That door that you touched, that door you opened, your finances helped build that door right there. That door spoke and said, welcome, come in the house of God. Where you're sitting right now, it's speaking. That, are you understand what I'm saying? Your finances in your hands is one thing, but your finances in the church takes on explosive dimensions, awesome. lives forever, yep. speaks out. Good. Those folks that got saved just this morning, that sound system, the money that went into that sound system, still talking, still talking, still talking, went in souls. I got to get back on the subject. Okay, so we see that protocol is broken with seed time and harvest. Now, look at a basic principle here. And this, I, I, we move through rather quickly. You know, Abraham, Abraham and, and Sarah, they wanted, a, they wanted a child. They were promised a child. In the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, they were, they were promised a child. And they would have legions of nations would come forth from them. 25 years later, they still don't have a child. And finally, in the 21st chapter of Genesis, 25 years later, we read first verse, and the Lord visited Sarah, and as he said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. So now 25 years. But I want to show you a 25-year shortcut. You want to see a 25-year shortcut? Now, just look in your, if you look in your Bible, the 21st chapter is here. The 20th chapter is here. The only thing between the two of them is the word 21st chapter. It really doesn't belong there. The prophet didn't write that. So it really is all together. So what does it say just two verses above this, what we just read? In the 20th chapter, the 17th, 18th verses, the last two verses of it. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up the womb of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. 
What goes between those two chapters is Ephesians 6, 8. Whatever good thing you cause to happen for anybody else, God will cause that same thing to happen for you. Abraham opens the wounds at Abimelech's house. Next verse, Sarah conceives. 25 years, Lord, I don't have faith. Well, look at the dust, son. Watch the dust. Okay, I got the dust. Lord, hell, what is it, Abraham? It's two in the morning. What do you want? There's no dust in my tent. Flip back the tent shape. Look at the stars. They got stars up there. Lord, how about this Ishmael? We came up with this Ishmael guy. Can we use him? No Ishmael. He's coming. 25 years of misery and a shortcut. Whatever good thing he caused to happen for anybody else, God will cause that same thing to happen for you. If you've got something you need in your life, Start finding a way to make it happen in somebody else's life, even if it's just a small part of it. If you're looking for college tuition for a son, don't take and take every nickel and hold it back. And the, find somebody that's trying to put a child through school. Put some money in their hand. Just say, hey, I want to plant a seed with you. I want to see this. I want to help you get that kid into college. And you watch. All of a sudden, you set a natural law, the law of seed time and harvest, the thing that made it possible for you to have breakfast this morning, seed time and harvest, the thing that's kept everybody alive through these things thousands of years seed time and harvest it'll go to work for you and it'll start accomplishing because the whole thing operates on seed time and harvest what good thing you cause to happen for someone else God will cause that same thing to happen for you are we learning anything well let's go now to the New Testament I think we all know that we're here because God opened up the gospel from the Jews opened it to the Gentiles. We familiar? Now, with that move, how did that take place? How did they decide? Did they draw straws to see which Gentile it would be? How did they do it? Does it run through your mind? Here you are in heaven and it's now time. We're going to turn this thing over to the Jews. We're going to go turn it over to the Gentiles. We're going to make the move. Has anybody thought about what Gentile we're going to use? Well, which Gentile do you use? There was millions of Gentiles on the earth. I mean, what is it that swung the balance? What, what, what made the deal happen for Cornelius? Let's go look at Cornelius and see. Uh, when you get into uh, Acts, the 10th chapter, first verse, first five verses, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers... And thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now, because of this, send men to Joppa and call one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Vine's expository dictionary says that a memorial is that which keeps a memory alive or something or someone alive in a person's memory. In heaven... At these days when these dynamic things were happening in, the, in, in, in Jerusalem, when prophecy was being fulfilled, when the Christ went to the cross, when he went to the tomb, rose the third day, the uh, day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, all of this focused excitement over here, there was a Gentile that had built a memorial. He had mixed his giving and his praying together and it became a memorial in the presence of God. Now, child of God, if, this, if you don't believe that, the problem's not with me. The problem's not with a finance message. The problem is you can't grasp what the Scripture says because the Scripture says the system of choosing the Gentile had to do with his offerings, had to do with his prayers. How many times do we have a thing that we need or we want and we can just simply take... It, it, 
it, it's so easy in church and we don't do it like we should. Just write memorial on that envelope whenever you make that envelope each week. And uh, it, put your tithe, put your offering, and then you have to have a memorial. Say, look, here, here's $50, here's $100. We have a memorial. This has to happen in our life. We're believing God. Well, Brother John, would, would, would that work? Listen, anything in this book that worked for anyone else, it'll work for you. Do you follow what I'm saying? Uh, if he did it before, he'll do it again. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he did it for anybody else, he'll do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. Are you catching this thing? Now, now, what am I trying to say to you? Isaiah said, my people are blind. They don't see what's going on. And in every one of these that I've showed you this far, we just move through those. Every one of you knew them. I didn't bring you a new scripture but there in it is that principle of seed time and harvest. It is absolutely a shortcut to whatever you're trying to accomplish in your life. If you can start putting a seed time and harvest principle to work, do it for other people if you want it done for you. Uh, be specific. Uh, farmers don't just go say, send me some seed and just throw seed all over the field. They're specific. There's corn over here. And then please, You've got to understand this about seed time and harvest. And it's not, never mentioned. But there's a moment after the corn is there green and all those ears are up, all of a sudden it'll just dry up and it'll look like it died. That wheat field that's green and just waving and all of a sudden it just becomes, just look like it died. See, there's a time called stalk time. Stalk time. No one ever mentioned stalk time. But there's a time that the whole thing looked like it died. And you can kill it with your mouth because by the words of your mouth, you can kill a thing. Do you follow what I'm saying? You better not say, oh, it didn't work. Oh, it didn't work. You better keep saying it worked because the other day I, was, I jumped out of the car last year at, at, at harvest time. I jumped out of the car and stood in front of a big cornfield and got a picture of it. And just uh, that I sent her out to a few folks and said, look, here's what it looks like just before you harvest. It does look dead, but don't call it dead because the stalk has to stiffen up or that fruit will weigh it over and it'll touch the ground and the vermin will eat it. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So, so you got to catch, you got to get a hold of this thing that open your eyes <laughs> all around you. Seed time and harvest is there. The next thing you need to accomplish, seed time and harvest is there. Uh, the, the, the house you want to pay off. Seed time and harvest is right there to help make it t come to pass. Oh, my goodness. Are, are we learning anything? Are we learning anything at all? Well, let's go a little further. Let's see who we got now. A prophet. You remember when Elijah? You remember when Elijah uh, broke the three and a half year drought? You talk about faith. You remember the faith they had? Go up and take a look what you see. Come back soon. Sir, I don't see a thing. Go back and look for clouds. Sir, I don't see a thing. Seven times. It's become one of the strongest teachings on faith when they teach about going again and again to the seventh time and then finally, yes, a cloud the size of a man's hand. But you know that it was all operated on the seed time and harvest principle. The whole thing operated on seed time and harvest principle. When you look at 1 Kings... 18, 31 through 35, they're preparing the altars. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with, uh, 32nd verse, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar, as great as would cane two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut in bullocks in pieces and laid the wood and filled the barrel with and, and filled four barrels with water and poured it on the sacrifice and the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And he did it a second time. They did do it a third time. And the water ran all around to the bottom. And now, theologically, when you're in school, they teach you, well, they poured all that water on there so that there wouldn't be any tricks pulled, that there wouldn't a match being maybe shot underneath, that the the... The one that the God that answered by fire would be God. So all that water's on there to, hey, whatever man sows, that's what he's going to reap. Yep, yep, what's the guy wanting? He's wanting a rainstorm. So what does he do? 
He puts 12 barrels of water on it. Yes, he had faith. He had faith to put, this one in the middle of a, of, of, a, of a famine and you take 12 barrels of water and pour it out. Your faith has been established right there. And seed, why seed? Well, three and a half years into a famine, they've eaten up all the seed. Ooh, are you catching that? Because now when the time comes that you get over there in uh, uh, 1 Kings 18, 41 through 46, and Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up and eat and drink for the sound of, of abundance of rain. And he said to his servant, go now and look the, towards heaven. And you know the story. He goes seven times. Seventh time he comes back and the rain starts and it's just a great downpour. And another great lesson on faith has been taught. How faith, uh, just keep asking, keep asking. No, no, no. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. Amen. I mean, if you're looking for water, sow water. If, <laughs> does anybody understand what I'm saying? You've got to sow what you want to reap. Amen. You can't go out here and hand out Afghan blankets, say, We're, I'm, I'm making Afghans for folks, that's my sowing. Listen, you'll end up with a mountain of Afghans in your retirement with no money. If you want money, you sow money. If you want Afghans, you sow Afghans. Listen, let me apologize. I was pretty heavy on you, wasn't I? Pretty heavy. <laughs> Being blind, heavy. Okay, let's get in something we all love. Okay, give me the last the last minute here together. We'll we'll have a big time. Psalms one eighteen twenty four. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Now we can get behind that, can't we? How many of you love that that verse? It's a happy day. It's a happy day verse, isn't it? Happy day. Well, no. It's a seed time and harvest verse. You see, David is not a bit happy when he says this. David needs money and he needs it right now. How do you get that, Brother John? Well, I've got to where I read more than one verse at a time. <laughs> verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Twenty. Next verse, save now. I beseech thee, O oh Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. <laughs> Let me break down that first verse. It said, this is the day which the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, you got 12 more hours in this day. <laughs> you can make me this miracle that I need. I can still be rejoicing for this day is over. He said, I'm not rejoicing now because I need prosperity. I need some money right now, Lord. Have you ever wondered why all these long miracles, why these miracles always take so long? You can't name me two miracles in the Bible that took a long time. Blind eyes, poop, open. Deaf ears, poop, open. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? But here, what do we got? This man knows that if he operates seed time and harvest, that he can be rejoicing for the days out. He knows that this finances he need can be in his hand before the day is out. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, look a little further. 26 verse. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed thee out of the house of God. God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. He said, Lord, I'm not looking for magic. I'm looking for a miracle. And I'm going to take seed time and harvest and put it to work. I've got the sacrifice bound on the altar. I'm making my offering right now, Lord. And I need some finances. And you can make it in this day. You can make it for me. Are you catching what I'm saying to you? Everywhere you look, seed time and harvest, seed time and harvest seed time and harvest one other let me quickly take you to a story over in the book of and we're not going to turn to it first kings the fourth chapter tells of a shunammite woman you know this woman the prophet came if you remember the prophet came to her house and she realized that he was coming often by this place by her place so remember she built a little room on the wall for him you remember that account 
And then she took and she furnished it. She put a table in there and she put some things and she put a bed in there. And when you step back and look at this scene, you're really seeing that that little cabin, that little room, and all that bed and all was her seed. Do you see that, that she planted that as seed into that man of God? Yeah. Now, several, maybe years later, her son is out with the father in the field, and he has a heat stroke. And he comes in, and he dies in his mother's arms. Now that mother takes him upstairs and lays him on her seed. Do you see what I just told you? That bed was a seed. She took that boy up there and laid him on that seed. You better have some significant seed in the ground because it doesn't come up sunshiny every day. There are days that you're going to need a seed a significant seed in the ground that some problem will rise up in your life and you can take that problem and lay it on top of that seed. Is anybody grasping what I'm saying to you? I'm talking to you about the most, I mean the real thing about seed time and harvest. Oh, it's real to be picked to be the first Gentile. Oh, it's real to, to, to have the child born. But when the death angel comes through your house, when you're down at the emergency room, you better have a seed, a significant seed in the ground to lay that daughter or son or wife or grandson on. Are you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Now, I can take you back in my life. One of the wealthiest men in San Diego, his boy was in a terrible accident. I'd been with him many times trying to get him to give his heart to the Lord. He finally gave his heart to the Lord, but he would not put any of his money into the kingdom of God. Very wealthy, always buy the meals, uh, have this dinner waiting for us somewhere. Here's tickets, go have dinner, wonderful, blah, 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 blah. But never a seed. One day I'm preaching and he comes right down the middle of the aisle of the church screaming like a banshee, my son, my son. He's in the emergency room. Come with me, Pastor. He's been almost cut in half. We went there. And the boy passed away. Here's a man. I'm not a miracle. Don't come get me when you need a miracle. You need to have things prepared in your own life so that your life is operating in this seed time and harvest principle at all times that you're in the seeding business, that you're in the memorial business, that you're seeing to it that, that you have your finances moving in and out of the kingdom of God so that in that hour that we hope comes to no one, what more comforting than to know I've got seed in the ground, Lord. When you talk to God, God, I've got seed in the ground. My baby must be lifted up. God, I've got seed in the ground. My business has got to be saved. I can't. I can't have this thing happen that just happened. Amen. Are you grasping me? Yes, sir. 19 years I've come here. More than that in the early years. And can you imagine for 19 years somebody comes and just talks about you, about finances, about finances. And then we still come to a day like today and almost every one of these things I brought to you was a surprise. It's got to get in our head that just like the seed of Christ that was put in the earth, that same way I became a son of God. Everything that has to do with my life has to do with seed time and harvest. And whatever shape my finances are in today, any time I turn them into a seed, they explode and they increase. Do you follow what I'm saying? And not only that, do they, when, as soon as I make them into a seed, they now become, they're seen, they're, they're known by the Lord. He sees them. The widow's might, out of all those givers, he said, hey, that woman right there, she outgave everyone. Because here's what's true. Most people know, well, yesterday, just give you a thought. I went and I bought, I bought this suit and I laid my credit card up and it didn't go through. But I reached in my pocket and I took the money and I paid for it. Now, 
There's times in my life before I understood seed time and harvest, I'd have stood there looking like an idiot. But it's a whole different life if you'll just keep seed in the ground. Keep seed in the ground. Seed into your church. Give life to your money. Make it living money that feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, that takes and brings forth good things into people's lives. As I always do in these meetings, I suggest to you that rather than having a lot of just dealing out all over through the month and week and trying to, the week and trying to catch the budget, and many, many, many first Sundays, we've caught the budget and paid the whole budget out of the first morning. And I, if I had a better message in my possession than what I preached this morning, I would have preached it. I bring the best I have to this meeting. And now I'm just, I, I look for you to bring the best you have. Get that seed in the ground. Because before this meeting's over, you could maybe see that seed bring forth something in your life that you really need. So would you plant right now? There's offering envelopes, I think, are there available to you. Would you plant right now a seed? And please, a significant seed. Not just an offer, a significant seed. One that gets your attention. If it gets your attention, it'll get God's attention. He feels about your offering the way you do. How you feel about it is how he feels. Some of you, it could... It, uh, you know, and, and, I, I, and I watch young Christians. There's some plateaus. There's that $500 level. There's a $500 level of giving that just moves you into a whole new kind of life. And there's a $1,000 level. A plateau at $1,000 that moves you into a whole new kind of giving and a whole new kind of living. And when is the time that you do it? Whatever, whatever you give is going to be good, but I could see some of you exercising that faith to put forth that thousand dollar gift that thousand dollar gift wouldn't take too many of you doing it this morning and you'd push this thing right the right over the top i haven't met the cost of the meeting and you will have laid in the store a tremendous seed a tremendous seed now if i offended anybody i apologize for me i don't apologize for the bible part but i apologize for me if i offended you okay but would you prepare your offering all over the room now, please, everyone preparing? This has been a step of faith. That I, I always ask, are you peaceful, sir, with the offering? Yes, sir. Okay. I always, seems like we've started these meetings with this, and it has been some of the greatest meetings and continuous. A lot of meetings don't last 20 years. It'll get to where finally there's nobody showing up. But this meeting stays attended well. It's a good meeting. It's got a good spirit behind it. Let's pay for it this morning. This morning, let's pay for the meeting. Amen. Would you prepare your offering? Just another minute or two. One time I came up here and I looked at the wrong clock. <laughs> and about eight, ten minutes, I was come down. I sit down. Pastor looked strange. <laughs> He said, well, if that's, what, if that's what God said to do, that's good. I'll accept it. But I was looking at the wrong clock. So anyway, if you're ready, if you need another minute, wave at me if you still need another moment. If you're not quite ready, in the back still not ready, here not ready, just take another minute. Okay, ushers, would you prepare? Get ready. Take just one more second. Some are still writing. Some of you give electronically. I'm not as up to speed on that as I should be. But exceptions are made for people that are 82, I think. <laughs> I'm not up to all the tech. Okay, lift it in the air, please, and we're going to pray. Father, I thank you there's more than enough. 
God, thank you that we can begin to see that our eyes are open, that we see these beautiful truths that just cluster around your word. And I thank you, God, for this great church, for the leadership. I thank you for the soundness of this church, the soundness of it. I thank you, God. And I thank you that many, many memorials are placed in place this morning. And Father, offerings are put forth, cedars sown, so many purposes. But you know every mind, you know every heart. And I know that you will come forth 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.